Hello and welcome everyone to this edition of the Research Roundup from Fidelity Digital Assets. My name is Chris Kuiper and I am joined once again, as usual, by my colleague Jack Newrider. Jack, I hope you had a wonderful holiday and I hope everyone uh, here listening had a wonderful holiday and a happy new year to you as well. And on that note, we've got kind of a special New Year's edition of this research roundup. We This has kind of become a tradition at Fidelity Digital Assets where in early January, we look at the past year, things that have gone down in the, in the digital asset space, but not just rehashing what happened. We like to take what happened and then contextualize that into the future, look ahead, provide some value to you, our listeners, as to what we're watching, what we uh, think we could see in the new year. We're not making big predictions, of course, but we are uh, playing out some scenarios and, and thinking about how these things could affect uh, the new year going ahead and what we're going to be watching closely as well. So here's a little bit of a preview of what we're going to go over. Uh, obviously, a bit of a recap, but more so we're going to dive into the macro. We're definitely going to talk a lot about uh, Bitcoin, uh, separately Ethereum. And then, Jack, I know you've been following a lot of stuff on the DeFi and stablecoin space as well. So let's get to kind of the hard part. The past year has not been kind, but as you can see, um, we are off that $3 trillion mark, total market cap that we hit back in November of 2021 when things were hitting new all-time highs. So it's been painful. I mean, we have to be honest about that. However, I like to say the class of 2022 has graduated from the School of Hard Knocks. And so we have learned some painful but very valuable lessons. And I truly believe you know, years from now, we're going to look back on this time and see all the value uh, that these events brought, you know, hard lessons that really can't be taught without some experience. And also the other thing that we've been increasingly focused on and emphasizing with all of this, all the things we've seen over the past years, the the centralized lenders, the the hacks, the exploits, the the poor risk management, and sometimes, you know, the outright fraud, although details are still coming out with a lot of this stuff, these things all have one thing in common, which is that they were all centered around either centralized parties or things that have gone on in finance since finance has been invented, you know, the dawn of time almost, uh, things of poor risk management, over leverage, being too greedy, all of those things that continually come up. This space is not different in terms of human nature, right? But all the more reason that we can kind of renew our focus on these core principles of what makes digital assets so unique, which is that that ability to not have to trust centralized parties, to, to have decentralized uh, networks, to have these trustless systems, to be able to trust uh, code and not some of these, these human actors. And so as painful as this has been, I do think it will be a wonderful learning opportunity and something that brings our market forward. And I really am excited about the new year. So as we get into this, you'll see we've got actually have a lot of stuff we're excited about. And I think in these bear markets is where a lot of this stuff gets built. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, even if you just look at like the prices that we've we've settled upon currently, it, it's sort of in line with the the blow off top in, in 2017 of, of sort of last cycle. Um, but think about all the infrastructure that's been built over those four or five plus years uh, around and inside of these ecosystems. And so, you know, it makes sense that we're at sort of a new plateau in terms of this, at least current bear market bottom. Yeah, absolutely. So before we get into some of the those things that are being built and the things we're watching, let's turn to you on the macro front, because that's obviously on everyone's mind, especially coming into the new year. Uh, what did we see in the past year? And how are you looking at the year ahead in terms of the macro picture and digital assets? Yeah, definitely. So I think the the first sort of word that comes to everybody's mind towards the end of 2021 was the word transitory in regards to inflation. Uh, and then really around that time, November of, of 2021, uh, end of into into 2022 is when the Fed really pivoted, you know, quite hard, I think most would say, and you can see it as that green line of the, the Fed funds rate. It dramatically increased from I think the range uh, at the start was you know zero to twenty five basis points. You had zero Fed funds rate. Uh, now we're at you know pushing five percent as we're talking at the start of twenty twenty three, and that's a dramatic change uh, in in Fed funds and interest rates over the past year. And that's been you know sort of a, a direct headwind for a lot of assets. Uh, if you look at at Fed funds less CPI, that that gray line, and this is the past 20 years, 
you know, you've never had a difference between the rate of inflation and in Fed funds as you had about a year ago, right? You had Fed funds at effectively zero and you had backwards looking CPI that was pushing seven, eight, nine percent. And then eventually the Fed did pivot. Right. And now the question is, where do we go from here where we're sitting? Right. Do do we continue to hike as the economy starts to show, show signs of, of maybe slowing where there's lagged effects to those interest rates? Right. They don't just take effect instantly. It takes time for debt to roll over and mature and then have to be you know, sort of re-upped at that higher rate. And now we're going to start to see some of those effects happen as we you know, go through this year. And then that the actual like tightening might start to really take place in the real economy. And then the question is, what does that do to the sort of Fed response function? Yeah, absolutely. And we're recording this on Friday, January 5. We just got the jobs number out, which was a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, more jobs than expected. The unemployment rate actually ticked down to 3.5%, a, a real low. Uh, but wage growth cooled, which is kind of what, what the Fed wanted to see as well. So um, very interesting that we'll be continuing to look forward there. Um, what do you have on this chart for us here, Jack? And, and what are you thinking in the year ahead as well? Yeah, so one of my big sort of like pet peeves of, of things throughout the year of 2022, and a thing that I talked about a lot, was everybody saying that Bitcoin failed as an inflation hedge. Um, but my my whole sort of point or thesis was around the fact that forward-looking rates of inflation embedded in the bond market, like inflation break-evens, uh, the, the annualized expectation of inflation over the next 10 years, that never really moved. It, it was in this, it was range bound from like two to two and a half percent. And you can say that the bond market's expectation of, of forward inflation is wrong, but that's what the bond market and financial assets are pricing in. And so inflation expectations never moved, but interest rates, as we saw in the last slide, Fed funds, you know, sort of trickles into the entire curve. Interest rates moved a lot. And so what was the net effect was a ratcheting up in forward real interest rates. And that raises the cost of capital and the opportunity cost for alternative assets, alternative store values like Bitcoin, especially if we think that, you know, crypto does tend to sit in this speculative bucket for traditional allocators. And so they're going to be less likely to allocate to the speculative bucket as the you know, opportunity cost on a forward basis rises. And you can see it in the chart here. When were when did uh, real interest rates? You know, we're we're seeing a ten year tips chart here. When did they bottom out? It was the same time when Bitcoin was was gaining traction, when crypto and, and speculation in the crypto space was gaining traction, and then immediately at that pivot, top of you know November twenty twenty one, you can see. That was the, the same top as Bitcoin. And I don't think that that's too much of a coincidence when you start tightening. Well, that's a, a net impact on Bitcoin, just like all other assets, as we've seen over the past year. And so the question is, where do, you know, where do interest rates go over the next year? If inflation has peaked right, going forward, if we see continued signs of, an, of backwards looking inflation rolling over, then maybe you know we're we're getting to that the the top of the cycle in terms of rate hikes from the Fed and some of that trickles down in terms of what was a huge headwind for Bitcoin maybe isn't totally there this year isn't as much of a headwind maybe it's not a tailwind right nobody's saying that maybe the the Fed's pivoting right away and rates are coming back in maybe they come back in a little bit and that's a bit of a tailwind but I don't think they're this direct head-on headwind that they were over the past year. And then for broader macro, if we look at like traditional equities, well, interest rates rising raises the discount rate on cash flows. And so multiples came in. And so we saw that with the repricing of equities. And now I think the question for equities is more so on the earnings side. It's like the top line of the DCF, whereas the discount rates, the bottom line was sort of the discussion last year. And what matters to equities kind of matters to, to Bitcoin because it's you know, where do risk assets go? That's going to dictate overall risk sentiment and people's willingness to, to allocate to crypto, which is seen as the risky bucket. So I actually think that although corporate earnings really have nothing to do with Bitcoin and, and crypto itself, it will sort of subliminally impact uh, people's risk appetite. And ultimately, earnings are, are going to be important to watch as we go through, you know, into the middle of this year. Yeah, absolutely. And I love all those points you made, Jack. The the thing that stands out to me that kind of ties this all together is uh, Bitcoin and digital assets do not live in a vacuum, right? <laughs> they're, they're relative to 
other alternatives, the US dollar and what's going on there with interest rates. And they're they're relative to other assets classes like equities, like you just said there. So uh, excellent points there to be made. So let's turn over to Bitcoin now. And in our, our written form, which you can find on our website, phillydigitalassets.com, I think we titled it um, Bitcoin, the, the lack of story in 2020. 22 was the biggest story. And so Bitcoin was pretty boring. We've gone on 14 years now. Uh, January 3 or 4 is the the Genesis day when the first, uh, the very first Bitcoin Genesis mock block was mined, excuse me. And so 14 years, uh, Bitcoin has chugged along and 2022 was no different. And so I know we sound kind of like a broken record here, but with so much chaos going on, it's just a beautiful thing to look at the network stats of Bitcoin and to see that it continues to perform, you know, pretty much flawlessly as we would have expected. And so in this chart here, you can see the cumulative value transacted over the Bitcoin network of 2021 versus 2022. And uh, we were up about uh, 13, 14 percent, I think, uh, surpassing 14 trillion. The number of transactions were actually down a bit, which is not surprising. I think they're down uh four or five percent, something like that, I want to say. And and that's not surprising in a bear market, uh, but obviously the number of Bitcoins increased. Now you might say, well, yeah, the price was down, so you have to transact more Bitcoins to get the same amount of value. But this chart is showing, no, the value, the dollar denominated value increased as well. And to put this in perspective, even if we're more conservative and we look at something like Coinmetrics has another metric where they adjust the value transacted uh, less the the change transaction. So with Bitcoin's UTXO, you, you send a transaction, you get change sent back to you. Uh, if you take those change amounts out, you are still at a little over $8 trillion, $8.2 trillion. And to put that in perspective, you know, I used to be an equity analyst covering payment companies, just looked at um, MasterCard's latest Q quarterly report. And over the last 12 months, ending September, MasterCard transacted gross dollar volumes of $8.2 trillion as well. So exactly the same amount that, that we're talking about here as a major, uh, one of the major players in the credit card space. Uh, the other thing I like to say is to people is, you know, if you saw Bitcoin's price was down 65% in 2022, down even more from its all-time high, traditional investor would say something's wrong with this thesis, something's wrong with this network, it experienced a bug, uh, the fundamentals must be deteriorating. Uh, but just a couple stats I have here, you know, active addresses were down a bit, but only 8%. Uh, hash rate, which is a story we've talked about all year, up 53%. I mean, that's incredible. The security budget of this network increased 53%, despite the price being down 65%. Number of nodes remained about constant. Um, so you, you just look at, you tick down all of these fundamental characteristics of, of Bitcoin uh, at the network level, which doesn't care about price. And it's all holding steady or or going up. And so, again, I know sounding like a broken record or preaching to the choir here, but I, I think it's a beautiful thing to to be able to witness all the chaos going on and seeing this base layer performing as we'd like. Yeah, the settlement network is completely intact. Yes, and, exactly. And that's, the, that's the ultimate point, right? It's right. going to keep churning. And then, uh, you know, the free market will price it as it will over time. Right. And then uh, in the written report, we put up the simple Bitcoin dominance chart uh, between Bitcoin, Ethereum, and and basically everything else, which we're just calling crypto here. And we just did a, a simple market cap. So number of coins times the last traded or current price. Uh, but in this chart, we, we added a little bit of a, a twist to here. This is the realized market cap dominance. So that previous chart shows that Bitcoin has held steady at around 40%. Uh, back to its lows in, in 2017, 18 in that bear market there. Uh, but this chart here uses the realized market cap. So we've talked about this before, but just as a refresher, the realized market cap takes each coin multiplied by the price at the time it was last moved and then adds it all up. So for, if you're looking at just Bitcoin, it's kind of that all in cost basis. Uh, but if you add them all up and show them as a percentage of the entire space, this is what you get. And so I love this chart because it shows uh, Bitcoin has actually been increasing its dominance during this bear market, going to almost 60%, I believe, uh, or currently at 52%, excuse me. Ethereum's also been gradually widening at 21%. And then that's all come at the expense of crypto. And you can clearly see kind of the, the big altcoin season, the ICO boom in 2017 here, uh, and then how that's shrinking as well. Now, again, some of these things in dominance term could go down if the pie gets bigger, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. 
Uh, but I do think the the salient point here is that even though Bitcoin was down very big, it's been kind of showing its blue chip strength throughout this this space relative to everything else. And considering this is realized market cap, right? That's times the the price that the asset last moved. There's like this Pareto distribution here happening where it's Bitcoin and Ethereum and people are like actually really using these networks and transacting with these tokens and then everything else. And you can see the the difference between the top of the of last cycle's ICO boom in, in January 2018, where that crypto, that gray area of kind of everything else was half the market. And now it's what cut in half from there, 25%, maybe it looks like from this chart. Yep. Um, and it's kind of telling of like the power laws taking place here where you know these large networks gain huge network effects. Yeah, absolutely. And that's another good point you make. The other reason we like this chart is because it's showing which ones are actually being used, circulating, right? It's got to be circulating or transacting to show up in this chart. And it, so it takes out a lot of scammy stuff. It also takes out some of these kind of founder tokens, like tokens that are, are issued, but they've never actually moved uh, in a yep. normal market cap chart. They would be included and multiplied, but they've never actually moved from their initial funding or you know allocation to founders. So I think that's a a good point to make as well. There's there's a couple in, in this from the data from Coinmetrics that isn't included in crypto. We should note like uh, the big ones are Solana and Avalanche, but even if you did add those, it wouldn't change the chart uh, story that much. All right, so Jack, I'll turn it to you now for Ethereum. Obviously a big year with the merge, uh, but it looks like in terms of the roadmap, we could see even a bigger year in 2023. So what are you looking at now that we've gone through the merge? And then um, what are some of the other things we're going to be watching in the next year here? Yeah. So like you said, we had the merge and and altogether it, it went off kind of without a hitch, right? I, I think there were some analogies of like, you, ha you have this plane flying and you're changing the engine and you, know, you could potentially ruin the entire system. But to the you know Ethereum developer community's credit, it, it seemed to have gone off, you know, it, pretty much exactly as designed. Yeah, uh, not now only the question. What's not that? only, uh, sorry, not only not uh, did it uh, happen technically, but even in terms of its price, I was shocked. Like this is one I got very wrong in 2022. I thought for sure we'd see a big price move in Ether one way yeah. or the other once it happened because you, you had traders on both sides taking different sides of that trade. And, and it was just amazingly priced in. Like I, I don't know the stats off the top of my head, but it, it barely budged at all. <laughs> Definitely something I was wrong on as well, which is like, having like an if then function kind of in your head going into the events of September is like, if it goes off successfully, then, you know, especially on a relative basis to other crypto assets, Ethereum probably outperforms in the following months and, you know, kind of surprisingly didn't. Uh, maybe some of that can be attributed to the fact that you're just in a market that continued to trend down and had other exogenous events happening where, you know, on a relative basis, Ethereum to, to Bitcoin, Bitcoin's historically held up better in a bear market because it's larger and that's just kind of continuing to happen but you know we'll, we'll ultimately see what what happens there but i think looking forward in terms of the roadmap a few things are clear uh one the merge did nothing materially in terms of scaling ethereum and so the focus has shifted onto how do we scale the protocol but users and, and developers are talking a lot about the, the scaling element of how do we scale Ethereum? But a lot of users are saying, wait a second, if we put assets in validators, they're not liquid yet. And we really want this to, to happen. And while developers wanted to have this big upgrade and, and put a bunch of things into what's being called the, the Shanghai uh, network upgrade, uh, ultimately, it looks like the focus as of late is being pared down to really just focusing on uh, allowing validator assets to be withdrawn and be liquid. So you can stake your assets and then you can unstake them and withdraw them from the validator and use that Ethereum. Whereas right now there's this like bifurcated market where you stake the asset and it's stuck in a validator. And there are some liquid staking derivatives where you can kind of represent that value, but it's kind of messy and complex at the moment. Whereas in the future, hopefully the, the timeline is around March. We'll see if, if that actually gets hit. There'll be the Shanghai upgrade that allows for you to stake. And then after a period of time, unstake uh, that asset uh, if you want to. Um, and so that's, that's coming in, in sort of the first half. And then I think in the second half, as well as throughout the whole year, there'll be discussions of how does Ethereum scale? And there's really two sort of roadmaps. One is 
uh, rollups and, and L2s and, and using basically uh, networks that that settle down onto Ethereum. And in this chart here, we can see uh, two versions of optimistic rollups, uh, Optimism and, and Arbitrum, uh, two of the most successful. And you can see the transaction count is rivaling L1, layer one Ethereum transactions um, already going into the new year. Uh, and then there's another uh, sort of subset of promising uh, ZK EVM rollups, uh, zero knowledge rollups, which I'm sure we'll we'll get talking about some of this stuff more as the year goes on. Um, but those uh, amongst many in the community are seen as sort of uh, the poster child of where L2s will go is, is ZK EVMs. Um, but layer twos are going to be a big conversation. And then I think Ethereum scaling itself in terms of sharding, those are sort of later upgrades that will be talked about more and more. And you'll hear that drum beat as we get into the second half of the year. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. On Shanghai, you know, we've got a, a colleague on our team, Max, who's got his ear to the ground listening to developer calls. And I was very surprised. He said in the last call just the other day, they're talking March, as you said, for Shanghai, because they're thinking about scaling down the scope of that upgrade and just making it focus basically on allowing withdrawals. Um, one thing I don't think you touched on yet is how do you think that's going to play out for Ether, the token? There's It's been locked up for a long time. Once this happens, is there going to be a run for the exits or is it now going to be kind of like, oh, phew, that's behind us, this you know, relieve some uncertainty and it actually increases people willing to stake? Yeah, it's a good question. So if we look at like the actual staking rate of Ethereum, it's only about 13-ish percent, 12 to 14 percent of total Ethereum are staked uh, versus comparable networks. Think of like Cosmos, Avalanche, Solana, other proof of stake networks are vastly more than 50%. Most are like 60, 70, 80% of assets are staked. And for Ethereum, I think it's a little bit different that like ultimately if we zoom out and just say Ethereum continues to exist and operate as designed five years from now, its staking rate might not be that high in the 60, 70, 80% because of a number of reasons. Uh, pre-mines where Ethereum's like relative level of pre-mine is lower than a lot of these you know, other proof of stake chains. Uh, where early founders staked those assets. And so it was easy to get up to this number of you know, 60, 70% of assets staked. But I do think there's a real chance that if we zoom out like a year after the Shanghai upgrade, that we could be double, triple, you know, 20, 30, 40% of ETH be staked on the network as validators. Whereas I think the conversation in the short term is like, there have been people that have been locked on the beacon chain since as early as December, 2020, when it first rolled out. And those people might want liquidity. And I do think that that's a true like statement in and of itself. You might see a line of, of people trying to get through the gates because only so many people can exit a validator at once, even when you know, Shanghai goes through. Um, but Ultimately, like if we look at the average price of ETH when it was staked, the average price is like $2,500. So on net, where we are today, I don't know, uh, $1,200 ETH, something around that level, like the average person is actually underwater that is staked. And so I don't think it's like we're going to see tons and tons of withdrawals. I think we'll see a period of withdrawals right after Shanghai. Uh, and then eventually like this flippening of more people will be in validators afterwards because then they have the ease of being able to stake and unstake. Yeah, definitely something we'll be watching. So look forward to March. I might have this kind of prognostication wrong already. I think if you would ask me a few weeks ago, I'd said, ah, Shanghai, I'm sure it's going to be delayed just like all their other stuff gets delayed. But looks like it might be swinging the other way where they're they're paring this down and really focusing on getting it done. Uh, all right, so let's turn now more to the DeFi and stablecoin space. What did we see last year, Jack, and, and what are you thinking is going to happen in the stablecoin space uh, in 2023? Yeah, I mean, I think a few things. Uh, stablecoins, you can see in this first chart on the left, in terms of cumulative value uh, settled using stablecoins, um, I actually think that there's an error there. I think that that's supposed to be billions. Um, so we have uh, nearly $8 trillion in value. 
uh, that was settled in stable coins. And this is like cumulative throughout the year. So that's why you see these big triangles and then they end at the year end and start at zero. Um, what you can also notice here is the actual value settled. If you look at the green line from 2021 to 2022, Tether stayed relatively stable. Whereas you can see USDC's total value settled as well as even the gray, you know, seven other stable coins that we aggregated together. Um, Th those are growing, right? And this chart uh, came from from Coinmetrics, uh, our friends over uh, in Boston as well. And so, so credit to their team for for creating it. But I think it, it really tells the story of stable coins are are being used as this borderless uh, fiat settlement payment rail. Um, and then we're also seeing sort of this change in terms of people want to use the regulated, trusted fiat stable coin, as opposed to the, you know, less regulated uh, operating offshore stable coin, which is Tether versus USDC. And you can see that in the market share here as well. And so I think overall, we're, we're probably going to see more regulators paying attention as the, the total value uh, settled, the AUM in stable coins continues to increase. Um, and I think that that helps regulated stable coins relative to unregulated stable coins. But what do you think, Chris? Yeah, I, I think you're seeing, you know, capital goes where it's treated best and it's going to be flowing into uh, a product that it's probably going to be, you know, <laughs> relatively better treated in terms of regulations and safety and transparency and security. You know, even just looking at what the stable coin invests in, you know, it's very safe, liquid uh, cash and cash like stuff, treasuries, bonds with USDC versus Tether. You know, there's still all kinds of questions. What's what's behind there? I did just check that that metric. It is uh, supposed to be a B instead of an M. So you're right, eight, tr eight trillion, because we were also just talking about this, how uh, this is very similar to what the Bitcoin network did itself and also similar to MasterCard. And, and the other thing too is, you know, people said, well, these stable coins are just used because traders are using them so much, but trading volumes are way down in 2022. So uh, to me, this says these things have in an incredible value proposition and people all over the world are using them. Uh, you know, we forget too, hyperinflation or very high inflation countries, people can get their hands on stable coins. And so they've got an out, they've got an alternative with, with basically being able to convert their depreciating currency into uh, the US dollar. Yeah, definitely. And and we, we talked about it uh, in the report for those that, that do read it, but algorithmic stable coins, uh, if we go back to May, uh, when, when Luna, Terra had their collapse, have not really been a much of a talking point uh, at the moment. And I think that, in terms of uh, a decentralized or less uh, less easily censored stablecoin, I think that Dai is going to sort of continue to fill that role for the time being. Even though it's it is backed by you know a lot of centralized real world assets, I think that you'll sort of have Dai as the the crypto native uh, stablecoin, and then you'll have the emergence of increasingly you know more regulated stablecoins like USDC taking market share. Yeah, yeah, interesting. All right, so we're running real short on time here, but if you can give us a, a few things that you're watching in the DeFi space as well for the next year. Yeah, so we had some uh, a number of uh, C5 failures last year, of course, and, and we don't need to replay those, but a lot of them were in the, the borrow lending space. Uh, and ultimately, a lot of these blue chip DeFi protocols on Ethereum continue to operate as they were designed. Uh, but they also were, you know, sort of using uh, used a lot of uh, relied a, upon a lot of leverage and trading volumes, and and those are really gone, right? They got wiped out, uh, and you can see sort of this this inverse relationship that has taken place between DeFi yields and traditional yields, where one of the calling cards in like 2020 was, oh, DeFi has such better yields, right? You could get five, six, seven percent on your cash through like Aave or, or through a centralized platform that was supposedly, you know, using these, these platforms, uh, whereas Fed funds was, was near zero. And now it's sort of inverted the opposite where Fed funds rose and interest rates in the traditional system rose. And on a relative basis, they're far more attractive. You can see it in the chart here of, of Aave's, you know, one of their deposit rates for, for uh, USDC, the, the stable coin. Um, and I think that this year we might start to see sort of a convergence of these yields, whether, you know, sort of by hook or by crook, if, if traditional rates come in a little bit and, and maybe we start to see some of those rates find their way on chain through unique avenues like Maker. Maker's doing a lot of things with real world assets. They're investing in treasuries and then they're passing it on to die savers through an increased die savings rate. 
Uh, we're seeing a lot of those types of things start to happen in unique places. And I think we need more regulatory clarity for a lot of that to happen. But I do think one of the sort of predictions I have this year is for the potential convergence between DeFi and TradFi yields, where they've historically been uh, inversely correlated from one another. And then overall, I think the, the failures in CFI create a huge opportunity in DeFi for lending, borrowing, derivatives, trading, kind of everything that, that can happen on centralized exchanges to happen on chain with improving user experiences and user interfaces. And I think there's a big opportunity there uh, to see those trading volumes move uh, off chain or, or on chain from off chain. Uh, it's kind of the way the crypto was designed to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's an excellent note to end on, Jack. Just the the kind of the bright future here, you know, it's been a tough year. I still don't think we're out of the woods on a lot of this stuff just because the calendar rolls over uh, doesn't mean a lot of the, the questions and things out there have been resolved yet. So we could be in for a rough or, or bumpy ride still to come. But I really do mean it that we're here for the long haul. We're here for the building, for the technology and all the things you just listed, you know, really gets me excited again for why we're here, what we're doing. And so um, thank you for your time today. Thank you for listening. And we hope to see you again next month. And we look forward to keeping you, uh, keeping you updated and with all of our research in the year to come.